Baruch Hashem, blessed is the Lord, and um, God bless everyone, and I'm glad that you're able to tune in today, and um, I would like, if you want to follow along, I would like to take you to the book of Obadiah, and today's message is, is very interesting, because uh, the Lord has been dealing with my heart on several little issues here in as I was reading in Obadiah, I had actually highlighted this a little while back, and uh, had having no idea that this prophecy that's written in Obadiah, part of this prophecy has actually been fulfilled or, or in the process of fulfilling. And so I really wanted to take and share this with you. Uh, before I go to this, though, um, I would like to read you an interesting verse in the book of Revelation. Um, this is uh, regarding the seventh seal, and I don't have in front of me right now the, uh, the corresponding one in the Tanakh, but I will at least express it to you. Uh, it says in the seventh seal, um, and when he, and that's chapter 8 of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense uh, that they should, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> to offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, Interesting things about this one, what is the silence about, the seventh seal? I know it's been a mystery for many, many years, at least for a lot of people. Those of you that listen here, uh, we have shared with you how that the Bible clearly states in the Tanakh uh, that everything keeps silence. He has risen up out of his holy habitation, and I wish I could tell you where that scripture is. Uh, it will be on the bottom of your screen, though, because when I go to do the editing, I'll make sure I put that for you. Uh, but he says that, let everything keep silent because he's risen up out of his holy habitation. This lets us know that the silence of the seventh seal is God standing up to do judgment. But it's another interesting point, though, in verse 4 I want to bring out before we go into, uh, before we go into Obadiah here. He says, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. It's so reminiscent of when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, and they began to cry out to God, and God said to Moses, I have remembered my people, and, and, and just paraphrasing that, and, and he says that, uh, you know, that you know, he's heard the cry, you know, of them being in bondage. So again, in the seventh seal, that's what we're actually seeing, is that God is hearing those prayers. They are coming before God, and he's going to answer uh, with vengeance, no less, because that silence is when he rises up. Now, I did a little mathematical thing out of curiosity. I thought, okay... We know that the Bible says uh, one year with the Lord is a thousand years, okay? So, I mean, excuse me, one day with the Lord is a thousand years here on earth. So I did a quick calculation. What's a half hour in heaven? Well, a half hour in heaven is about 21 years. Uh, I don't know if that's the significance or not, but in the calculation I did, uh, it was something along that lines there. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, nonetheless, but he says about, so it could have been less, could have been more, don't know. But another thing that came to my mind, and this was something that actually began in 1918 in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, in the United States, it happened in 1962 uh, and has become more prominent, especially uh, since the 1990s. And that is that the prayer that had been done in events and public arenas where prayer was always permitted over certain issues in the name of the Lord 
whether it was the name of Yeshua, that is Jesus, or, or just whatever, it had been replaced with a moment of silence. And I was actually watching the, the they were bringing the back to uh, the Netherlands, the bodies of 40, 40 of those bodies of the people that were killed in the plane crash. And that's exactly what they did as well. And they, they did a moment of silence. And But what was ironic to me is that here Satan has tried to take and ban out prayers and replaced it with a moment of silence. But in reality, what has God done? He's taken where Satan has tried to do something evil and he's used it against him. It's actually testifying of the age you're living in is the age where he will return, where he will come back for vengeance, the age of silence. I just thought that was kind of an interesting little note there. Um, so anyway, so we see that in the seventh seal, the prayers are going up. And when prayers go up before God, and of course, the thundering and the lightning and the earthquake, we know that in uh, the Bible that uh, even, I believe it is in uh, Saul there, well, the, well in, think about it like this. In the Exodus story, when God came down on the mountain, it thundered and quaked and all kinds of things like that were happening. So very interesting, very interesting. Paul says when he's seen the Lord and he the Lord spoke to him. The rest of them said it thundered. So it sounds like to me that God is on his way at that point. All right, turn with me, if you would, to Obadiah. Uh, the, uh, I believe it's the sixth chapter in Obadiah. Um, and we're going to go to verse 10. Excuse me. I don't even know if there is six chapters in Obadiah. No. My, my apology, there is no six. It's just one chapter. Obadiah's entire writing consists of one chapter, but what this man says in one chapter is remarkable. Uh, we're going to go to verse 10. Now, those of you that know already, I've shown you and taught you that Edom is Rome. But now you're going to find out for a fact that it's Rome. And you're going to find out what's going to happen to them. Let me just read to you, starting verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. You've got to remember, Adam, uh, before Edom was, when it was Jacob, it was Esau and Jacob. And of course, Esau and Jacob, God hated Esau. The Bible clearly says he did. And yet the Bible says he was, wasn't even born yet. We find that in the Christian writings. Why would he hate him? Well, you know, the thing is, what it really comes down to is God knew his descendants, the Romans, specifically the Vatican, not the actual citizens in Rome. You have people like Giulio Mioti, who is a, a warrior for Israel, but yet a Roman citizen. So it's not the Romans per se, but it was, it's that system of Antichrist that is there. But let me just share with you what he says here. Uh, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Okay, what is the lots on Jerusalem being cast about? That's what they did. That's what the Romans did for Yeshua, for his garments. They cast lots. He was Jerusalem. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, and the day that he became a stranger. This is when God is going to judge the house of Judah because they sold out Yeshua. Now this is very important to listen to, especially for those that do not believe that the Jewish people, um, let, me, let me say it like this here. There's a lot of people that think that all the Jews since the time of Yeshua, uh, they're commonly called Christ killers and that unless they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and make that confession when they die, they all go to hell. And of course, as I've stated, you know, then if, if you believe that and you say you stand with Israel, why would you stand with somebody that God has cursed and they're all going to hell? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. It's kind of ludicrous to even suggest that. Um, and secondly, what's really important as well is that 
we, we, we've got to consider, as I've already said in several videos there, you know, that th they did what they did because it was the only way to bring life back and to restore redemption, not just to Israel, but to all mankind. So what they, the, the, the job that God required of them would also require a punishment. And this is the hardest thing that they ever had to do. So I'm just very um, concerned when people want to condemn the Jews and say that as soon as they die, they all go to hell. I mean, that's even contrary to when God says, whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, and whoever curses Israel shall be cursed. Um, you know, uh, now I know that there's the argument would be it's Abraham when he says that too, but he also, he doesn't just limit it to Abraham. He actually, because uh, he tells Abraham, whoever blesses you will be blessed, and whoever curses you will be cursed. He also goes further with, uh, I believe it's with Isaac as well, and even Jacob. God does this with Jacob. It's one of the reasons why. Uh, we know that it represents for Israel because God told him, whoever blesses you will be blessed, whoever curses you will be cursed. So if, if God will bless those that bless Israel as a people, then how can we curse them and say they're going to hell? You, you see what I'm saying? I hope you understand right there on that. But anyway, let's just see what God says through his prophet Obadiah because I think that'll help clear up a lot of this for you as well. In verse 12, he says, But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in, in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should, uh, should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. 70 A.D. The children of Judah. See, the house of Judah. The house of Judah is destroyed in 70 A.D. And he tells you, he's, he's prophesying of this. This, is, this was a future event for Obadiah. And neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You see, what did Paul say in Romans? Don't boast yourself against those natural branches. For God is able to take you out and regraft them in. And the thing is, is that will happen. I'm not talking about the genuine uh, Gentile believers that love the Lord. In fact, it's interesting because I believe that God has taken and raised up new Christians here in the last, oh, how, no, I, I don't even say how many years, but over the last few years, he's been raising up new believers and bringing out the ones that are in the denominational systems, bringing them out to himself. Then he goes on to verse 13, says, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Now, it's interesting. God is telling the Romans that they should have not have come in because it's Esau, Edom. Edom is Rome. And he says to them, you should have not come in there. And yet God allowed them to come in order to bring judgment upon Israel. But he's telling them, you shouldn't have done it. I mean, it's bewilderment to the mind to think that God knows that he allowed that to happen because, you know, Israel had rejected and he knows that the word of God had promised that they would be scattered to the four winds of the earth. And now he's telling them, you shouldn't have done it. Maybe that might make a little bit more sense. I know it seems awkward to hear God say that when we know that this was meant to happen anyway, but it also makes sense then. I'll leave that alone. You should have not looked upon their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands upon their substance in the day of their calamity. Rome took the temple treasures and took them back to Rome, where they are in the Vatican until this day. And I've actually got eyewitness confirmation from Jewish people that have said they have seen. Um, and, and people that have been to the Vatican. So it's, I guess it's like an enticement. Neither shouldst thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Do you know when Yeshua said, flee to the hills? And I'm not saying it doesn't have a compound fulfillment. But he said, when you see Israel compassed about with armies, flee to the mountains, you and Judea. 
And it says here in Obadiah, Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Trying to stop them, the believers. He tried to kill them anyway. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the, in the day of distress. The Jews that, did, that just refused to leave and they stayed there to their death. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down. And they shall be as though they had not been. That's an annihilation completely. Keep that verse, verse 16, in your mind very closely. I'm going to tell you something about it in just a moment. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Now, he's telling you where they're doing this, and now he names it as Mount Zion. Verse 16, let's look at it again closely. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain. Do you realize that was just fulfilled? My Jewish brethren, you hear what I'm telling you? The prophet Obadiah, verse 16, was fulfilled only a couple of weeks ago. Israeli government officials that permitted the Vatican to be able to come and have a mass in the very tomb of David, do you realize? You permitted the fulfillment of Obadiah, verse 16. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, when you allowed them to do a mass, when you allowed them to bring their communion cup in, as they call it, their wine cup, and they drank and they held their mass, did you realize you allowed the heathen, you allowed Edom. In fact, if you do not believe that Edom is Rome now, then you tell me who is the one that came and drank on Mount Zion in Israel recently that God is angry with. You tell me then who was the one that came and took the spoils of Israel and took them back to the city called Rome. You tell me who surrounded this city and actually overcame them. It was the Romans. Who was in control of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? And who again is once again setting up their power in there? And now they are drinking on God's holy mountain their wine. It is Rome. There is no way around this. You're watching biblical prophecy unfold. And I'm not talking about, I hear all kinds of false prophets. And I make no claims of any such thing. But one thing that irritates me more than anything is as I watch so many people claiming themselves to be prophets. I really believe that if God sends a prophet, he won't go out sounding his own little horn. God will vindicate a prophet by the things that actually takes place before him or her. A prophetess as well. Miriam, God said to Israel, I have called Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and you did not hear them. That's kind of interesting. He threw Miriam right into the bunch there and said that Israel refused to hear. If God has called you, if you see visions, if God is in the things that you see are things that actually come to pass, just be humble about it. Tell the people what the Lord shows you. That's perfectly okay. But I'm seeing way too many people prophesy things and they do not happen. Part of them do, part of them don't. Well, in that case, let's do the way that Israel did, drag them out and stone them and put away the sin from Israel. God does not make that kind of a mistake with his prophets. What he tells them and what they will speak, if they're speaking for him, and don't tell me you have thus saith the Lord. The only one that will ever have thus saith the Lord is when the name of God is restored. That is thus saith the Lord.
Let's go to verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. So now you've heard what the Word of God has to say. That's through Obadiah the prophet, a genuine prophet of God that has prophesied of the events that you have watched literally unfold a few weeks ago. As I said to you the other day, though, when Joseph put his brethren into the prison for three days, now he clearly, Obadiah says that they're going to be a fire to their enemies. That's kind of interesting because when the two witnesses come on the scene, fire proceeded from their mouth and devours their enemies. It's not, I do not believe it's a literal fire that comes flaming like a flamethrower out of their mouth. I just believe that the thing is, like Elijah, he called for fire down to destroy the enemies. Now, when they tried to, they wanted to do that when Yeshua was here, Yeshua said, you do not know what spirit you are of. He came, it was a time of mercy, but a time of judgment is nearing at hand, and God will bring that fire down. When they speak, God will consume with a holy fire the enemies of Israel even though they may go under bondage for the next three years once, once that time comes. Now, I can't say that time is right now, but I believe it is nearing. Once Rome gets a full hold with Israel and they allow enough terror to come Israel's way in order to be able to force Israel into this covenant, then Israel will be under a, a full Roman occupation once again. Israel will still be a people, and then soon God will deliver them. In fact, in the story of Joseph, we see clearly that when his brothers were in prison for that three years, or excuse me, three days in their case, they begin to say, did we not see the anguish of our brother? Did we not realize what he had done? And that's what God will do with the children of Israel as well. They will cause them to recognize during this time where they had made their mistakes. And I believe this is why God has sent the two witnesses for that very purpose, to get Israel to recognize where they had made the mistake. Then the borders will open up at the end of that, and then they will begin to rise up against the Romans. They will bring back their brothers, the house of Israel as well, as God promised, because clearly, according to Revelation, uh, I believe it's also in Revelation uh, 7, and uh, I forget, the, maybe it's uh, chapter 14, of the 144,000, there's 12,000 from each tribe that are sealed. Well, Zechariah 12, 7 says that God gathers the house of Judah first. So all the tribes are not home as of yet, but they will be soon. Thank you for watching. I trust this message is a blessing for you uh, and for your family. Want to encourage you, if you are not a part of being a supporter of this ministry, there's no way we can do it without you. So many things are happening. And even as we reported on the news the other night, um, Sister uh, Esther in Israel and as well another brother I just found out, and he's going to actually be a part of the news. We're going to try to do that, I hope, on Friday to bring them in as a witness that they've not been able to wire money to Israel, Israeli banks. And yet we realize that we are going back home to Israel uh, sometime later this year. We've been looking at September but depending on how the conflicts are and, of course, the finances to be able to do so, uh, we're just waiting to see how God leads on that. Uh, I do want to also mention to you, I still get reports coming to me that I have, was forcibly taken out of Israel, which is completely a lie. Uh, even people saying that they prophesied these things totally erroneous, uh, and, and, it, and it's just saddening to see that people would do that or to think these things. I mean, it just lets you know that people that prophesy falsely, it's not of God. So, no, we are intending to fully go back to Israel, uh, hopefully here around September. I'd like to be there during the high holidays. That's been our intention. Uh, then, of course, they closed the airports recently. I don't think that'll be long-term as of yet, but the hour is coming where they're going to close those airports and you will not be able to get back into Israel at all. 
So as I've said many times before, if you want to do something for the Jewish people, now's the time to do it. We love you guys tremendously. And if you do not know, you are able to give on our website, israelreturns.com. There's a donation place there on the website, or you can mail us either way. That's on the bottom of your screen. Shalom. God bless you. We love you, and we thank you for all that you do for us. And be praying for us, because without your prayers, there's nothing